Number two, in terms of demand, is easily CBN. And number three, sneakily catching up, is THCB. I think a lot of people are becoming hip to it, and especially as the costs are coming down. Yeah. So THCV is the one that is meant to give you more energy and help with weight loss. Is that right? <sighs> those are the words on the street. We're not saying yet that those have been anywhere near proven, but that's what people are looking to use it for. Yes. And bear in mind that I have to be conscious of what I say because this is considered that we sell these products. So I need to be careful with health claims. Sure. But users report, and there are some studies that show that it helps with appetite suppression. I wouldn't say the word weight loss. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of it. You know, I, I have a little saying that I say where basically anybody who studies cannabinoids day in and day out, and then they say that they're an expert on them has not truly studied them. Mm -hmm. The more I look, the more I realize, the less that I know. So I never want to say something can or cannot do anything, but I have never seen any sort of concrete evidence that there's any mechanism outside of appetite suppression mm. in regards to weight loss. There's also studies talking about how it can help regulate blood sugar, which could be extremely beneficial for diabetics or anybody else who is trying to manage their A1C. So yeah, focus, energy, those are typically the things that are associated with it. THCV is on a lot of products right now claiming to suppress our appetites. So Natalia, what do we know about THCV? THCV is an interesting one because it has been shown to improve glucose tolerance and decrease insulin sensitivity in obese mice. And I believe they have started human trials with it and it's showing signs of being an anti-inflammatory, can be used in pain, can be used in neuroprotection. I think a lot of the human data has come from its effects as a topical application in reducing dermal problems related to acne as well. So the topical applications of these minor cannabinoids is an avenue that people maybe are less excited about or paying less attention to, but which is some of the only data that is being done on humans is to do with their effects as topicals. So that's something to look out for. Interesting. We'll definitely keep our eye on that one. So a lot of information about minor cannabinoids therapeutic potentials seems to be anecdotal so far. That is, of course, because the law keeps cannabis illegal and therefore very hard to study. But what about the research we do have from other countries on minor cannabinoids? Does the research show that these anecdotal effects are proving to be true? A lot of the research that we have on minor cannabinoids is based on animal models. So there's not too much clinical data. There is some, but the majority is taken from animal models. And in animal models, there is evidence of the analgesic, anti-inflammatory, muscle and joint pain relief, delayed seizure progression and anticonvulsant properties of a few of these minor cannabinoids. And in one particular review of, it was over 2,300 studies, the researchers concluded that there was a lot of positive evidence to suggest the neuroprotective potential of minor cannabinoids. So their potential use for treating things like epilepsy, Huntington's, Parkinson's, and the reason that people get excited about minor cannabinoids is that today, none of them have been clinically demonstrated to act as psychotropic drugs. So just to kind of do a little bit of keyword definition, if a substance is psychoactive, it's anything that reacts with your brain's chemistry. So caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, cannabis. If a substance is psychotropic, it's something that affects your perception of reality, mood awareness, and sometimes time. So that's things like THC-rich cannabis, Xanax, things like that. And researchers are excited yeah. because the majority of minor cannabinoids don't behave psychotropically, which is very positive because when you have a demographic of patients who have no experience with cannabis or they don't want to try cannabis because they don't want the psychotropic effects you then wouldn't yeah. be able to prescribe anything with high THC in it, for example. So these minor cannabinoids essentially broaden the range of cannabinoid-based medicines that 
can be afforded to more patients globally. Oh my gosh, this is going to change healthcare. This is so exciting. I mean, it could for sure. I mean, that's what people are getting excited about. But it's a long process, you know. Like I said, after you have your data on animal models to get clinical data, it's very expensive. It takes time to set up. And that's kind of one of the last hurdles before something can be released to the public as a pharmaceutically regulated drug. But there is, yeah, there is a lot of excitement and positivity. But the bottom line is we need more research and we need more clinical research. I think what can happen in the cannabis community is a study will come out and people will immediately cherry pick the the most interesting headline, which is just like, you know, this can be anticonvulsant or this can be used for Parkinson's without the context of, okay, but this was shown in mice models, for example. It doesn't always translate that when something has a positive impact at at one stage, it's going to, when it's tested on humans, it's going to show that same effect. Mm. It's, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, it's, it's complicated, but there is potential. There is definitely potential there. We need more studies. This is just always, always, always for sure. Potentially very helpful chemicals here being created by the plants in our world that appear to be useful for many human ailments. So what does a person have to do to grow a plant that produces all these useful minor cannabinoids? As Natalia explained, it's all about selective breeding. So breeding plants is essentially you look for the qualities that you like in a particular species or a particular set of plants so you might be selecting for this plant grows really vigorously or this is very healthy or seems to be very well suited to this climate or isn't badly affected by this kind of pests or this kind of pathogen usually in cannabis when people are selecting for things that they like it comes down to the secondary metabolite profile of the plant so basically the chemical profile, what are the terpenes like? So what is, what is the aromatic profile of the plant like? What's the cannabinoid content like? What's the ratio of different cannabinoids in the plant like? So typically, because it's become a high value crop due to its secondary metabolites, so things like flavonoids, terpenes, cannabinoids, in cannabis, people breed based on chemical profile, but also from a grower point of view, you've you've got to also select plants that are a healthy stock and grow very, very well. Breeding is, it's theoretically, it's simple, but what people don't really understand is that it takes time because in order to selectively breed for the properties that you want to enhance in your offspring generation, you need to keep mm. back crossing plants with basically the parent stock to ensure that those traits are selected for over time and you don't end up with too much expression of characteristics that you're not interested in. Right. Okay. So, so it's like, like, like kind of what we've done with yeah, dogs. Yeah, it's exactly like <laughs> <We've>, that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. We want them to be fast or we want them to be good killers or mm-hmm. we want them to be guard mm-hmm. dogs and the same sort of thing with cannabis. You pick what you like about about what a plant looks like when it comes mm-hmm. out, and that is its phenotype, exactly. and you can use the the seeds from mm-hmm. that to re-express those same traits over and over mm-hmm. again. Yes, and in order to do that successfully, you need to go through stabilization, which is when you back cross and you rebreed with the parents. Because if you don't do that in a population of a hundred seeds, you will end up with a larger amount of phenotypes than what you want. Essentially, what you're going for in when you're breeding for an F1 stock is a homogenous phenotype so that when you germinate these seeds, there's very, very few differences in the seed stock. And that is kind of the gold standard uh-huh. of growing from seeds that is commonplace in lots of other vegetables that we've been doing in things like peppers and tomatoes and cucumbers. These are crops that have been stabilized over decades. But right now, because of the criminalization of cannabis, we're running a little bit behind on establishing really stable F1 seed lines that producers can get given and then just sow and then 
quite accurately predict, okay, I'm going to end up with two, three, four, maybe five, but the fewer the better phenotypes in this group of plants. What's F1? It's basically, it stands for filial generation one. So it's the first generation of plants that come from when you cross two different hybrids. Ah, gotcha. So it's the OG. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Essentially. Okay, so selective breeding of the plants produces more minor cannabinoids. But how about the extraction process? What do we do to get those minor cannabinoids off the plant and into our bodies? I would say the extraction is a small portion of what we do, and the vast majority of what we do is in the processing and post-processing. Mm. So our facility is a ethanol extraction lab. There's various secondary processes that can be implemented in order to isolate the desired compound that we're looking to pull from the plant, from the crude extract. So you use ethanol to extract these? Correct. How do you use ethanol to get a little molecule, specific molecules off a plant? It's pretty, uh, pretty actually pretty simple and very similar to the traditional hash, ice hash making methodology. We extract from industrial hemp. We'll take that raw industrial hemp and we run it through a centrifuge. So basically a really, really, really fast washing machine, so to speak, that contains extremely cold ethanol. A lot of people use the term cryogenic, but it's technically not cryogenic, but somewhere around negative 80 Celsius. Wow. So the combination of both the ethanol allowing for solubility of the individual cannabinoids into, I mean, it's pretty much well known that cannabinoids and THC and all of these molecules are most soluble into fats or alcohol. So the combination of that plus the extremely cold temperatures not only allow it easier for those trichomes containing a large portion of the active phytocannabinoids to snap off of the plant, but the cold also inhibits the transfer of the less desirable plant waxes, fats, the undesirables that we would further have to take the extracted material through winterization and filtration to get rid of. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Wow. You said that you can test for 20 different cannabinoids in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. So at the moment you're producing CBD, CBN, THCV. What forms are these products coming in? Are they in edibles, tinctures? How do you make them? There's crystallizing cannabinoids, ones that appear in a crystalline like powder almost. So your CBD, your CBG, your CBN can be scooped and melted and Whoa. weighed easily. You have non-crystallizing cannabinoids like CBC, which I hate calling any sort of viscous isolate a distillate, but that's how it acts and behaves. Mm. We've actually, uh, we utilize, we have one of our products blackout. In order to prevent the crystallization in the cartridge, we use a ample amount of CBC. Yes, it lends to the effects, but the amount of CBC blended in with it actually prevents it from nucleating and crystallizing in a small cartridge. Mm. So there's a lot of added benefits to non-crystallizing cannabinoids. Same with cannabis citrin, CBT. THCV appears like a, God, it has like five forms. It starts looking like a regular amber distillate. And then when it dries, it becomes almost like a clear. And then we freeze it. And when we break it up, it's a white powder. And then as it's exposed to air, it oxidizes and becomes almost purple. Wow. So <laughs> there's a lot of interesting forms they come in. But typically when people think of an isolate, they think of a crystal powder. Yeah. But the reality is, is that an isolate is just any sort of form that is only one known cannabinoid. So a lot of the time people can, can buy these and they can scoop it, they can put it into like drinks or foods or whatever. You have vapes available, is that right? You can vape the oils? Yes, we do vapables. And what we focus on in terms of our products are there's no unknowns. You know, there, there's, there's this huge split in the industry where a lot of people will say anything but whole plant is a bust. Mm. And you know what? There's some applications that's 100% true. 
in regards to like our products, for example, you know, I'll use our blackout, which I, hmm. our blackout is a four to three to one CBN, CBC to CBD. It's intended for nighttime. Again, I don't want to say for sleep, that would be a health claim. But when it comes to something like that, where somebody 